Okay, Twitch says we're streaming. Welcome to week eight. We're getting down to the end of the course. Congratulations to all of you who've hung in for this long. Just three weeks to go. So today I asked you to read the Dynamo paper. And so I wanna say right off the bat, if you struggled with this paper, you're not alone. This may have been the first academic research paper that some of you have read, at least the first that you may have read for a class. And it's a different kind of reading than you might be used to. If you try to plow right through from beginning to the end, then that's not necessarily the most effective way to read this kind of paper. So we can talk a little bit about strategies for reading research papers, uh, especially since we're going to have another reading assignment coming up in about a week. Uh, but um, what I want to spend most of our time on today is discussing some of the cool ideas that are in this paper. So our whole agenda today will be about uh, the Dynamo paper. So we're going to quickly review uh, some of the old ideas that we already talked about last time and uh, previously in the course. So. And we'll discuss how they, they come up in the paper. So, um, review of old ideas. This will include um, availability, network partitions, eventual consistency, application-specific conflict resolution, and there's more, right? But that's, that's kind of the main highlights that we're going to talk about. And then we'll talk about some new things that we haven't yet discussed in the class, but, uh, but do come up in the paper. So this will include anti-entropy with Merkle trees, gossip, Forum consistency, tail latency, and then of course there's also more, but I think that's about what we'll have time for for today. All right, so let's jump in. I, I want to try to contextualize this a little bit before I start talking about this whole laundry list of topics. First, I want to—I guess I'll add something to the beginning here. It's just like, why? Why are we reading this paper? Who cares? So I want to say a little bit about why this paper is important and influential. So the Dynamo paper came out in 2007, and it, it really influenced the way in which a lot of people conducted systems research. And uh, so before this paper, there was a lot of focus on strong consistency. And not only that, but the focus was on strong consistency in especially unforgiving settings, like for example, settings where, uh, where there were Byzantine faults. And so then the Dynamo paper came along and they said, not only do we not care about Byzantine faults, not only do we not care about security, right? Because this paper mentioned that they're, they're only operating, they're talking about a context in which they're only running on machines that are in Amazon data centers, and they're not worried about those machines being compromised, right? So they're not worried about that stuff. Not only do we not care about any of that, we don't even care about having strong consistency. So their priorities are very different than what a lot of the kind of preceding or popular work at the time was doing. 
So the, in the olden days, the assumption was that, of course, you needed to have strong consistency. And that was considered practically an answered question. And so people had kind of moved on to working on other things like Byzantine fault tolerance and so on. And then Amazon came along and their priorities were totally different. And so this was really in some ways revolutionary and it, sh it kind of heralded a shift in what the focus would be in systems research for the next 10, 15 years. And I have to say, I don't personally love the writing of the Dynamo paper. I think that some of the writing is just not great. And, um, but, it's, but I think it's a terrific paper to read in terms of how it connects with this class and how it touches on a whole lot of the concepts that we've already discussed. So now that you've actually looked at the paper, hopefully, these are some of the concepts that's, that we've talked about so far in this class that play some sort of a role in Dynamo. Uh, so, so let's talk about these, these old ideas. So availability. This is a big one. Uh, so how did we define availability? Remind me, when we talked last time, how did we define this notion of availability? Yeah, that's right. We said something like, every request will receive a response. So that's one way to talk about availability. We could also say something like, every request gets a response quickly. Or we could talk about it in a sort of probabilistic way. We could say, 99.9% .9 of requests get a response quickly. So these are all ways to talk about availability. But to a first approximation, it's something like this. All requests re receive a response. So if somebody wants to make an update, say put something in a shopping cart, then you go ahead and let them do it no matter what. Network partition, no problem. You just You don't want to wait around to get acknowledgments from all the replicas. You serve the request and you respond to the client no matter what. So that's a big one. And that's uh, a huge factor in the design of, of Dynamo. I just met, mentioned network partitions. Tied to this topic of availability. So this is another big one. What is a network partition? Anybody? All right, all right. Shark seating under sea optic fiber optic cable. Sure. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so network partition is when you have some machines in part of the network that can't communicate with some machines in another part, unable to reach machines in another part. So. Some machine or machines can't talk to others. Network partitions are temporary and they're unintentional. 
So I'm not talking about like a network topology here where you int intentionally make it so one machine doesn't communicate directly with another machine. Instead, I'm talking about a situation where you have some machines that are supposed to be able to talk to each other, but for some temporary period of time can't. And then there's this topic of eventual consistency. which goes hand in hand with uh, talking about uh, availability and network partitions. If you want to offer high availability and partition tolerance, you may have to relax your consistency requirements. Now, as we discussed last time, this property of eventual consistency fundamentally belongs in a different category from those consistency models we talked about. So we talked about strong consistency and causal consistency and so on. Eventual consistency belongs, belongs in a different category because it's a liveness property. And it says that replicas eventually agree. And more specifically, it says that if updates stop arriving, the replicas will come to agree. Now this might seem like a kind of silly definition because in practice updates never may stop arriving. Uh, but it's a useful uh, kind of rule of thumb. So I wouldn't put eventual consistency in a hierarchy along with strong consistency, causal consistency, and the rest. Uh, not even at the very bottom of that hierarchy because it's a different kind of property. All of those consistency models are safety properties. This one's a liveness property. So what about safety in the context of Dynamo? Well, I think it's hard to say exactly what safety property you get from Dynamo in terms of consistency. You recall we talked last time about a safety property called strong convergence, uh, which is the property that if two replicas uh, have gotten the same set of updates, possibly in different orders, uh, then their states will agree. Uh, so that's a safety property. And that's a part of what we talked about that's known as strong eventual consistency, which is a property that has a safety component and a liveness component. But the Dynamo paper doesn't actually claim to offer strong convergence or a strong eventual consistency. In fact, those were ideas that kind of popped up a few years later. And by the way, Amazon did not invent this concept of eventual consistency. So this term, eventual consistency, was coined by Doug Terry and his colleagues uh, to describe a system that they built called Bayou in the, in the mid-90s. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, look up, uh, look up Bayou. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, but Amazon, although they did not invent this term eventual consistency, they certainly popularized it to the point that now a lot of people think that Amazon invented this concept. And I've been guilty of this myself. I've cited Amazon's work or work by Amazon people uh, when I've needed to cite this concept of eventual consistency. Okay, so we've talked about all these things. Uh, we also talked a little bit about application specific conflict resolution. This is that situation where you might have one replica that, uh, that has something in a shopping cart, uh, like a book, and you have another replica that has something else in a shopping cart, like a blender. And the client gets to figure out what to do with those conflicting uh, states. So the client gets to figure out that what it's actually supposed to do is take the union in the case of, uh, of shopping carts. So I don't know if you saw, but there was a little footnote in the Dynamo paper about this. It was actually really interesting. They say that with the conflict resolution mechanism that they're using for shopping carts, there's a bug. 
Does anybody remember? Does anybody remember who might have happened to read the paper and see that footnote? Do you remember what they said the bug is? While you're thinking about that, there's a uh, question in chat. Based on the Dynamo paper, wouldn't always allowing rights be a safety property in the scenario in which systems may be failing? So if you're talking about availability, availability is a, is a liveness property for sure. If you want, you can insert the word eventually here. If that helps it looks a little, look a little bit more like a liveness property to you. If you're thinking more in terms of every request gets a response within a certain timeout, then that's starting to sound a little bit more like a safety property because that's something that actually could be violated within a finite execution. That's not necessarily the classical way of reasoning about availability. Classically, we think of availability as being a, as being a liveness property. Okay, does anybody remember what the Dynamo shopping cart bug was? This was only mentioned really in passing in the paper, so it's okay if you if you didn't. Yeah, that's right. So the good. So the 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 bug is that deleted items can reappear in a cart. Why? Why do you think that can happen? Well, it has to do with this way of resolving conflicts. So if one replica knew about one item in the shopping cart, like this book, and another replica knew about another uh, totally different copy of the shopping cart containing something like this blender, and then the client takes the union of them, then that's all fine and good, right? But let's say, yeah, you're right. So somebody just mentions merging with an unupdated replica, or maybe it could be something like this. What if one of the replicas has found out about uh, both updates? Let's say one replica has found out about the book and the blender. And then, so then we have this other replica over here, uh, which maybe just had the book. So at that point, we're still fine, right? Like the union of these is still uh, what we want, right? The union of, of, of these two sets is still book and blender, one of each. Uh, and the book has maybe been copied over here. But then let's say that this replica decides to remove the book. So now we have an empty set here. The empty set is being unioned with this set containing both. And that again gives you the book and the blender. So the replica that did the delete, if the delete didn't propagate over to the other replica uh, before this query is made, then this deleted item could pop up again because there still could be a copy of it elsewhere. I think this is really interesting. This notion, you know, we talk about replication as a way to, uh, to tolerate faults, right? We don't want to lose our data. We don't want to lose our data, so we replicate it. Seems like a good idea. However, when you want to get rid of something, then replication can be your enemy. And I was talking to a friend at Google a while ago about this, who was talking about compliance with the uh, with with G the GDPR, which is a European law that has to do with uh, with privacy and not storing user data. 
one of the issues that uh, my friend was dealing with was in order to comply with the law, they had to make sure that all copies of certain user data were removed. And making sure that all copies are removed in a replicated system can be extra challenging. So this is really interesting, right? It would seem that deletion is different from addition, right? If you're only adding to item, item, items to carts, then it's not a problem. But it seems that deletion has kind of an unusual relationship uh, with this conflict resolution mechanism where we're trying to take the union of different replicas. So that's something interesting to think about. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later in the course if we have time. OK. So Dynamo, of course, gets used for all kinds of things other than shopping carts. So set union doesn't always make sense to do. So they let you provide your own conflict resolution mechanism. This is just one particular example of a conflict resolution mechanism that you could plug in and use with Dynamo. That's why we call it application specific, right? This is what might make sense for the shopping cart service. But for something else, some other mechanism might be better. You get to specify it on your own. What does Dynamo do if you don't provide your own conflict resolution mechanism? What does Dynamo do then? Does anybody remember? That's right, yeah. It takes the latest right. So I'll say application specific con conflict resolution or LWW, which stands for last right wins. If you don't have any application specific conflict resolution mechanism to help it out, Dynamo will use last right wins. So, questions about any of that? Okay. So here's a question for y'all. Uh, let's just think about shopping carts for a second. Ah, there's a question about preference lists. So I believe the notion of preference lists in Dynamo uh, doesn't have to do with conflict resolution in that sense. I believe that has to do with to whom you replicate. So I think that was a different notion of, of, um, of preference. Uh, but we'll talk about that more later. If not today, then on Thursday. OK, so here's a question for you all. Let's just think about shopping carts. And for now, um, let's just think about adding items to shopping carts. So with addition of, items to item, addition of items to shopping carts, we have this really nice property that rights commute with each other. And we don't care about the order they arrive. So if I add the book and then the blender, that's going to be the same as if I add the blender and then the book. Because we're treating both of those as sets, right? And sets don't have an order. So rights commute. What does commutativity mean, by the way, when I say that rights commute with each other? Well, if we're talking about uh, grade school math, grade school arithmetic, um, we say that 
uh, addition is commutative, for example. So, So the addition operation is commutative. So that means that a plus b equals b plus a. So changing the order of the operands doesn't change the result. So when I say that writes commute with each other, I'm sort of using the notion of commutativity in a different way here, because I'm, I'm no longer talking about a binary operation. But it's the same basic idea that order doesn't affect the result. Um, so here's my question for you. With shopping carts, we have this, this nice commutativity of rights, and that by itself is really nice because that's enough to give us strong convergence. Remember, strong convergence is this property that we talked about, which says that if you've received the same set of updates in some order, then your states will agree. So if the rights are commutative, that'll give you strong convergence. But the dynamo paper doesn't only do that. It also talks about vector clocks. So why do we also need vector clocks? Well, so normally vector clocks would be for enforcing causal consistency or causal delivery or something like that. But they didn't promise causal consistency in this paper. So what, are we, what do we have the vector clocks for? If we're doing shopping carts, what do you need them for? I think it's to minimize those sort of deletion anomalies that that footnote was about. So the vector clocks are able to rule out most of the deletion anomalies. You're still occasionally going to have a deletion anomaly where you've deleted something and then it reappears in the cart. But they've decided that they're okay with that. Okay, so every now and then, you're going to get into a situation where replicas disagree. And maybe even one of them is going to have an update that's causally later than the other, according to their vector clocks. Or maybe they disagree because of something that vector clocks can't help with. Maybe they disagree because of concurrent updates. But one way or another, you're in a situation where replicas disagree. So one of the challenges here in the first place is finding out that they disagree. So if I'm standing here and drawing Lamport diagrams for you, then we have a God's eye view of what's going on in the whole system, in the whole execution. And you can see that there's disagreement. But how do nodes within the system figure out that they may disagree with nodes in the other system? If one replica thinks that say x is three, does it have any way of necessarily finding out that somebody else thinks think that x is four? No, not necessarily. So Dynamo has a couple of mechanisms in place that will allow the system to find out about and resolve those sorts of conflicts. So I should stay here. Step one, find out that they disagree. This is not something that we've spent much time on yet in this course. We haven't had to think about this, mostly because we've either been dealing with mechanisms that only do strongly consistent replication, and so we haven't had to worry about replicas disagreeing by the time that our response gets back to the client. Or it just hasn't been our concern, right? Like when we talk about causal consistency, causal consistency can lead you to a situation where replicas do disagree because they could get concurrent ups updates, right? And causal consistency doesn't rule out those sorts of concurrent updates. But in practice, you might want to do something about it if replicas disagree. 
So, Dynamo has a couple of mechanisms that we'll discuss. One of those mechanisms is called anti-entropy. Another one is called gossip. The way this works in Dynamo is every so often, say once per second, a node will randomly pick another node and will contact it and ask it what its state is. So to be very clear, um, there are two different things being discussed here. When the paper talks about anti-entropy, they're talking about resolving conflicts in application state. And by this, I mean the application is a key value store, right? Dynamo is a key value store. So by this, I mean differences in the actual key value pairs that are being stored, the data, the actual data that's being stored. When the paper talks about gossip, it's talking about resolving a different kind of conflict. Does anybody remember what kind of state we're talking about when we talk about gossip? Gossip is about resolving conflicts in something other than the application state. Does anybody remember what kind of state is being talked about? The view, good, yeah. So think back to when we talked about different kinds of problems that all amount to consensus problems. This had to do with one of those. So the problem, one of the problems that we talked about was the group membership problem, the problem of knowing which nodes are actually up, which nodes are actually participating in the system. Well, that's another kind of state that has to be kept consistent between replicates. So in addition to the actual data being stored, they all have to keep track of what nodes are up. So you could call this view state. And view means who's up. In Dynamo, this is done via this mechanism called gossip. And the current view of membership is only eventually consistent, just like the data is only eventually consistent. So once per second, there's this gossip thing where a node contacts another node to say, hey, what's your view of who's up and running? And gradually they all figure it out. What I find really interesting about this is that in the paper, they say they used to have a mechanism that maintained a, a globally consistent view. So I take that to mean that they used to have a mechanism that, uh, that gave them strong consistency for views. But then they figured out that they didn't need it. So they, they do gossip instead, and that ends up being good enough. So there's this interesting bit of historical background in the paper where they say, hey, we used to try to do something more challenging for try to, trying to keep the views consistent. And then we figured out that we could just get away with doing this gossip thing where we just have replicas periodically contact each other and say, hey, who's your view? So Dynamo has these two different but similar mechanisms in place for resolving conflicts in application state, the actual key value pairs that are being stored, and resolving conflicts in group mem membership state, meaning the nodes views of which other replicas are up and running. And yes, yeah, so there's a question in chat about how this relates to what we're doing for assignment three. Yeah, so the part of the assignment that involves views, you could implement something like, like Dynamo's gossip. For the part of the assignment that involves the actual key value state, for that, we're not asking you to necessarily implement something like anti-entropy because the, why do we need anti-entropy? Well, anti-entropy is for ensuring something that's actually better 
than causal consistency. You know how we talked about you can end up in a situation where replicas disagree because of concurrent rights. Like this, this replica over here could end up thinking that x is 4, and this one could end up thinking that x is 3, because clients have concurrently written those things. Even in a causally consistent system, you could end up that way. What anti-entropy does is it tries to resolve those kinds of conflicts by having, uh, having nodes talk to one another, tell each other what their state is. So in general, these two words are synonyms, right? And anti-entropy is, is just a kind of a fancy way to say gossip. But in the context of the Dynamo paper, they mean different things. So I'm going to say synonyms in general but have but they have different meanings in Dynamo. Okay, so gossip and anti-entropy are both for resolving conflicts in some kind of state. But then you might ask yourself, why do we need two different mechanisms, right? If they're both for resolving conflicts in state, how are these two problems different? Practically speaking, how is it different? How is resolving conflicts in application state different from resolving conflicts in, in view state in terms of your practical implementation and the concerns that you might have, practically speaking. What's the difference? There must be some difference, right? Because otherwise they wouldn't bother to have these two distinct mechanisms that they give different treatment to in the paper. What do you think? Yeah, okay, so there's a comment that with view state we need to know who's up so that we can make progress, but yeah, okay, but I think you might also need to know uh, how to, I think you might also need to resolve uh, conflicts in application state to be able to make progress. Okay, so let's think about it this way. If replicas are sending around information to each other about what their current state is. How big are those states going to be? If it's the view state, how much information is that? Well, it's probably not very much information, right? It's just gonna be like a list of some machines and maybe not very many, right? A handful, maybe, maybe a few dozen, maybe, you know, at most, you know, a hundred, I don't know, not that many. But what about application state? Well, how many key value pairs are you talking about, right? How many key value pairs could you have on a particular replica? You could have a whole lot, couldn't you? So in the case of application state, the amount of state that you're talking about could be much, much larger. With this view state, you, you essentially just have some small list of nodes, right? You have a list of some relatively small number of nodes, but for application state, you could have a lot of key value pairs. So, change in size means we have to change our approach, right? So, given that these 
application states are so large, it's not going to be feasible for replicas to send their complete state to each other all the time, right? That would take a lot of bandwidth. So what do they do instead? What does Dynamo do to minimize the cost of data transfer when it's trying to do this anti-entropy data synchronization? That's right, you don't want to send a gigabyte over the wire if you can help it, right? So what does Dynamo do to make this big thing less big? Good, yeah. Dynamo uses something called Merkle trees, also known as hash trees. So how does Dynamo minimize data transfer cost during anti-entropy? With Merkle trees. Also known as hash trees. So a Merkle tree looks something like this. So you've got some pieces of data. any data. In the case of Dynamo, there's, it, the data will be key value pairs, but it doesn't really matter what they are. Um, Merkle trees will work with any kind of data. So let's just say that I have some blocks of data, like this. So at the leaves of the tree, I'm starting at the bottom of the tree and I'm going to draw up, you have these chunks of data. And then you take the hash of each chunk of data using some hash function. So those are the leaf nodes of the tree. And then for the non-leaf nodes, every node is going to store the hash of its children. So the parent here is going to it's going to combine the hash of its uh, children somehow. So maybe we'll take the hash of one, maybe we'll concatenate it with the hash of two, and then we'll take the hash of all that. Similarly over here. So to make this a little bit easier to write, let's give some names to these things. So let's call this this, which is one big hash value. Let's call it A. And let's call this hash value B. And so then up here, the parent of those is going to be the hash of A and B. And that's the root. So these are our data, right? This might be like some key value pairs. And so on. So at the leaves of the tree, you have hashes of each chunk of data. And for the non-leaf nodes, every node is going to store the hash of its children. So in this case, it, it happens to be a binary tree. So the non-leaf nodes have two children. And the way that I've done it is just that they're concatenating together the, their children's hash values. So this plus here could be concatenation, and then take the hash of that, and so on up to the root. So this 
hash value up here at the root is incorporating information about all of the hash values under it. What's the purpose of doing all this? Why do we bother to do all this? Right, so we want to minimize the amount of data to compare, good. What, will this, what this will do is it'll make it easier to quickly compare large amounts of data. So let's say, for instance, that we have two replicas. So let's, we, let's say that we have replica one. And um, replica one has some key value pairs. Replica 2 has some key value pairs. And maybe Replica 2 is only a little different. In particular, let's say that Replica 2 only differs in the value of this one key, y. It would be really, really expensive for replica one to have to send its whole state over to replica two, or for replica two to send its whole state over to replica one. And it especially seems ridiculous because there's only this one, this one point of disagreement, right? But you don't know that until you talk to the other replica. How are you going to quickly find out that there's only this one point of disagreement between the replicas? So that's where Merkle trees come in. So in this case, you know, maybe I'll put y, I'll put this over here. So maybe this is what the Merkle tree looks like on replica one. So this data item number two is going to be different on those two replicas since uh, the hash of this item number two is going to be different as well. So then the parent here, where we're concatenating hash one and hash two, is also going to be different on the two replicas. And finally, the root will be different. So to compare their state, replicas can start by comparing the root of the Merkle tree. So each of these replicas will be storing uh, this Merkle tree. When they have to compare their state with each other during this anti-entropy process, the first thing that they can do is merely send over this root hash. So it's one little hash value that says something that kind of summarizes the whole state of, of the, the key value pairs at that moment. If their hash values agree at the root, then great. Then you know that all the underlying data is going to be the same at that point. If the root nodes disagree, then you have to look further for the difference. So in this case, you can send over these two next level down hashes, these two child hashes, like the hash here and the hash here. Well, if the replicas are like this, then they're going to agree. Um, let's see, it was this one that was different, right? This is the one, this is the only one that differed between the two replicas. So this, this value will agree between these two replicas. And so that'll tell it, okay, I don't have to look any further down that side of this binary tree. Instead, I need to keep looking here. So then we'll compare those hash values and so on. And so you'll keep on going until you get to the point of disagreement. So child A will differ because, um, uh, because of this, um, th this, this value being different. And so it's going to have a different hash. So we can then zero in on A and look at its children, right? And then figure out that it's this item number two that differs. And we figured it out by only comparing this relatively small number of hash values. And we only had to send those over the network instead of sending lots and lots of data. 
So Merkle trees are really nice. They're used in all kinds of systems, not only key value stores like this. They're really handy anytime that you have to compare large data sets, especially if you need to do so over a network where network bandwidth is a, is a scarce resource. Uh, so if you want to, you can go look up Merkle trees and read about them on their own, on your own. Um, they're called Merkle trees uh, because they were invented by somebody with the last name of Merkle. So it's kind of a silly name. Uh, I believe uh, that individual actually has a patent on them. Uh, but um, hash trees is a slightly less silly name, but somehow the, the name Merkle trees seems to have caught on. So that's what everybody calls them. Questions about any of that? So another place that you might see Merkle trees used is if you want to check the authenticity of data. If you have a copy of some data and you want to make sure that it compares to some other authentic source, but it's maybe it's a huge data set, right? So going through all of the data and checking the veracity of all of that data might be really expensive to do. What you can instead do is use a mechanism like this. It's kind of like with checksums, right? So if you're familiar with the notion of a checksum, that tells you a kind of summary of what's uh, of, of some much larger piece of data. So you can figure out, does my data match yours by, by computing a checksum? If the checksums disagree, then you know that the data doesn't match. Now, it's not a perfect uh, 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 summary, right? Maybe the checksums agree, but still the data might disagree, right? But you do know for sure that if the checksums disagree, then so does the data. So similarly with Merkle trees, we try to we, we, we try to use a hash function that, you know, we try to use a uniform hash function and all that good stuff. It doesn't necessarily have to be a cryptographically secure hash function because as they say in the Dynamo paper, they don't care about that, right? They trust everybody involved. They only care about saving bandwidth in this paper. They, they care about minimizing data transfer costs. They're not worried, their threat model does not include uh, machines being compromised, right? Uh, but what they do care about is making sure that they don't send too much data over the network when they're trying to resolve conflicts in application state. Uh, so that's what Merkle trees are for. One of the things that Merkle trees can be used for. Any questions about that? I have a blog post that I can point you to if you're curious. So a student uh, asked a question once um, when I was teaching this course about um, what would happen if these replicas actually had different sets of, of, of key value pairs, right? Like what if replica two didn't have this one? Well, how would you how, how would you make these trees agree right like you want you want the data to be organized in the same way um, otherwise you won't otherwise the comparison of the hashes won't be meaningful so I have a blog post that I can point you to that's about that and I don't think it's necessarily so important uh, for the purpose of this class um, but um, b because it's not it's it's uh, it's kind of an aside um, but I'll uh, I'll share it uh, on Zulip later. Okay, so I think now is a good time to pause and do our quiz question. And it's currently four fourteen, so let's come back at four twenty four. See you in 10 minutes.
Two minute warning. Okay, welcome back. All right, shifting gears to a different topic. So another concept that I want to touch on, uh, we have not talked about yet in this course, is this concept of quorum consistency. So in replication strategies like primary backup or chain replication, clients would only talk to particular nodes, right? So in the case of primary backup, clients only talk to the primary. And in chain replication, uh, clients only talk to the head for writes and the tail for reads. But in Dynamo, it's different. So in Dynamo, the client can actually talk to any replica or all of them. So no replica is going to play a distinguished role. So it's kind of similar, actually, to what you're implementing for the assignment. So suppose that we have a client. And let's say that we have three replicas. Oops. That's supposed to be a letter R. So in this setting, the client is actually aware of all of these nodes. And the client is able to talk to any or all of them. So in some sense, this is kind of interesting. The client actually kind of starts to resemble the primary from primary backup replication. Because recall what the primary does in primary backup. It goes out and talks to all the replicas and gets responses from all of them. So if the client wanted to, it could go out and ask every node a question and get responses from all of them. And if it wants to know the value of a particular key, let's say, it could ask all the nodes, get responses from all of them. But how many does it have to talk to? How many should it talk to? So in quorum systems, this is something that you can configure. So quorum systems let you configure how many replicas you can talk to. So there are three important variables that are configurable in a quorum system. So n is the number of replicas. So here n happens to be 3. w which is called the right quorum, this is how many replicas
have to acknowledge a right. Uh, for it to be considered completed. And then it may not surprise you to learn that they read Purim. Is how many replicas have to acknowledge you? before you can consider a read operation to have completed. So clearly uh, W and R here are both gonna be at most N, but they could be less than N. So let me toss an idea out there. Let's suppose that we have this three replica system. And let's say that we use the following settings. So n is three. Let's set w to three and r to one. So in other words, when you do a write, you have to write to everybody. And when you do a read, you just read from one. This is kind of a subtle question, but let me ask it this way. Would this give you strong consistency? What do you think? Think about that for a moment. You know, some professors like to do polls for things like this. But um, I mean, I think it's actually kind of a subtle question. So I think it's worth spending a little time talking about instead of just saying a yes or no answer. Yeah, good question. So the question in chat is, don't the strongly consistent replication techniques that we talked about already, already demonstrate this? Yeah, so this kind of looks a lot like primary backup or chain replication, doesn't it? With primary backup and chain replication, we have to do the write on everybody, and we only read from one. So that's an argument for why this might give you strong consistency, yeah. But I would argue that it's maybe a little bit more subtle than that, right? Because when we're talking about those strongly consistent replication techniques of, of primary backup and, and chain replication, we're talking about a setting where the client only is going to talk to a designated one of the replicas, right? The client's only going to talk to a particular one. Then that replica's job is to go out and talk to everybody else. And then that, then it's another particular replica's job, either the primary, if it's primary backup, or the tail in chain replication, uh, to respond to the client. And, the, that, and that response, recall that that's the commit point, right? So that commit point is very important, right? The commit point is the point at which you know that everybody's gotten that right. But 
what if you have something like this? What if, uh, what if you have concurrent rights? So what if, uh, what if this client is writing to all these replicas here? Maybe writing X. And then maybe just doing a read from one of the replicas. And this is all fine and good, but what if another client comes along? And maybe that client is using a similar approach. Maybe they're also using that sort of uh, read one uh, approach and write to three approach. When we were doing primary backup and chain replication, let's say just, let's talk about primary backup in, as an example. The role of the primary is to determine the order of writes. So the primary serves as a sort of synchronization point that decides on the order of writes and is going to send them out to the backups in that order. But there's no such synchronization point here. So if these writes come in in a different order, then you could still end up with replicas disagreeing. So this sort of quorum consistency approach, this is called, uh, there's a name for this, it's called read one, write all. Or Rawa for short. So this kind of approach could still lead to a situation in which you don't have strong consistency. So the three rights would need to occur as a transaction that gets ordered in a particular way in order for this approach to actually give you strong consistency. So that's an entire topic, I think, and I don't have really room to cover it in this course. But in any case, um, this is an approach that does get used a lot. And it does give you, you know, something good, right? It lets you make sure that your, your write is saved in three different places. It makes you, lets you make sure that your write has, has been actually landed on all these replicas um, before you do a read. It doesn't say anything about whether other writes may or may not sneak in. So it's not quite the same as what you get from something like, uh, something, something like primary backup. So that's one issue. There's also another reason not to do this. Um, and it's the same kind of issue you get with things like primary backup or chain replication, uh, which is that it's not fault tolerant in the sense that if a node crashes, or if there's a network partition here that separates some nodes from the client, then we can't consider a write to have completed. So if the write quorum is the same as the number of replicas, but there's some partition that's separating uh, some of the replicas from the client, then the client, uh, the client can't do any writes. You can't say that the writes have necessarily completed. And primary backup and chain replication have the same problem until they detect the failure and then remove the failed node and update everybody's view and all of that stuff. And then of course, another issue is that writes are just slow, right? If you have to wait for everybody to acknowledge the right, and uh, then it takes a while, maybe. So kind of same issue as we see with primary backup and, and chain replication, writes are slow. So, it may not surprise you to learn that this read one, write all setting is not uh, what the Dynamo paper suggests using. So I'm, in answer to this question, would this give you strong consistency? Uh, I'm gonna say not necessarily. And in any case, it's not what the Dynamo paper suggests. In fact, and you might have uh, seen this if you looked at the, uh, the experiments near the end of the paper. Uh, when you have three replicas, what do they actually suggest doing? 
how do they suggest setting these write, this write quorum and this read quorum in the, in the Dynamo paper? It's kind of interesting what they choose to do. So just to be clear, strong consistency is totally out the window. We're giving up on that with Dynamo. Exactly, yeah. So you want to read and write two out of the three. So they suggest doing a read quorum of two and a write quorum of two. So what does that end up looking like? What happens then? Well, now I think we're getting pretty... Uh, Pretty complicated here, so maybe we should switch over to drawing Lamport diagrams. Um, so let's say we have our client and our replicas. Ah, that's better. Now we can talk about time. Okay, so let's say that we do a write of a particular key and then we read it. So let's say that I'm going to write a key like x is 5. So we said that the write quorum was 2. So that means that I have to write to 2 at least. So let's say that I write to these two. And let's say that they both acknowledge. And now I want to do a read. Well, I have to read from 2. Well. Maybe I'm lucky and I read from the same ones that I just wrote to, but maybe I'm not lucky. So maybe I'm going to read over here. So this is one of the ones that I wrote to before. So this one knows that x is 5, but maybe this one thought something else. So when we get back answers, we're not necessarily going to get back from every one of our reads the same thing that we previously wrote. However, notice that the read and write quorums overlap. So in particular, if you add the read and write quorums together, you get something that's bigger than the, the total number of, of nodes that there are. So you know that you're going to get at least one response that has that latest right. Now, how do you figure out which of these is what you actually want, you know, five and four? Well, that's your problem, right? You might not have uh, the best conflict resolution strategy, and that's on you to figure out as the client. But at least you know that somebody's going to tell you the most recently written data. Now, sometimes the notion of, of read quorum is defined differently. So I only defined it before as how many replicas have to respond to a read operation. Sometimes you'll see papers that say, or you'll see settings of books where they say a, a, a read quorum of two means you have to hear back from at least two with the same value. So I've seen it defined that way in some places, but I don't think that's what the Dynamo paper means by it. So in general, if you have this property 
uh, that the read quorum and the write quorum together are greater than the total number. Then you know that every read quorum is going to intersect with every write quorum. And so you know that you won't get what's known as a stale read. You know that somebody is going to send you back uh, the most recently written data. There's kind of more to say about this, but, um, but that's kind of the, the short version. So in quorum systems, you can configure these numbers. And um, so uh, Cassandra, for example, is an example of a of a data store that lets you do this. And there are others as well. So you can tune these numbers uh, to kind of get what you want, right? If you want it to be really, really easy to do writes, then your write quorum will be lower but then your fault tolerance is correspondingly less, right? Like if only one replica has to respond to, uh, to a write, and then that replica immediately crashes, then that's not great. On the other hand, if replicas are gossiping between each other, then, you know, replica three over here that didn't get the write, well, you know, maybe sooner or later it'll find it out, right? You know, maybe here, maybe you'll be lucky. Maybe the write will land over here. And then you will hear back from everybody at the same time. But you saved time, right? Because you didn't have to wait for that query to go all the way to replica three and then get and then for the acknowledgement to get all the way back to you just to be able to do the write in the first place. So you've saved some time, and maybe most of the time it'll be good enough. That's a trade-off that you have to think about when you're choosing what these settings should be for R and W in a, set in a system that supports this kind of thing. OK, there's only one more topic that's on my agenda today. And this is actually something that I, I don't always teach about. Um, but I realized as I was thinking back, uh, looking back at the, at the Dynamo paper, this is really something that's very important. And uh, they, they bring it up repeatedly. So I think it's something that we should talk about. Tail latency. OK, so before we talk about this, somebody refresh my memory on, on how we defined latency. What do we mean when we talk about latency? How long it takes to get a response, yeah. Time between the start and the end of the action. Time between invocation and a response. So another way to say that is how long it takes to get a response. So let's say that you have a system that's serving a whole bunch of requests. And you know maybe it's a key value store like Dynamo or like the one that you're implementing. Uh, but some kind of system that, that responds to requests. So naturally, you care about what the latency is, right? You want those requests to be served quickly. Well, let's say that you have collected some data about latency. So um, 
I'll just make up some numbers here. So let's say that some requests only take, uh, say, one millisecond uh, to service. And then, you know, if you're unlucky, some requests take a lot longer, like maybe they take 10 milliseconds. And then if you're really unlucky, they might take like 100. So let's say that you've gathered a bunch of data over time about how long it takes to, uh, uh, to, to respond to a request. Um, so, you know, if it's a fairly typical system, um, so maybe this axis over here is um, number of requests. Um, so this is like a low number here, like zero, and then this is a higher number, like a thousand or something, let's say a hundred. Um, so then you have something like some kind of a curve that looks like this, where, you know, maybe a lot of requests get served quickly. And then you have this long tail that kind of tails off like that. So the shape of this curve, which, you know, might not, not be, you know, entirely accurate or to scale or whatever, but you might have something that's shaped a lot like this, right? Where, uh, a lot of your requests, you know, the great majority of them are getting served, you know, very quickly. And then you have this sort of long tail here of not very many requests, but um, some, but those requests take a really long time. Uh, so here's the thing. Uh, let's say that you have that picture and then I'll draw a different picture here. where the labels on the axes are the same and every, everything's the same. But let's just say that the, the tail is a little bit shorter. So let's say that it's like this. Um, so let's say that this, uh, this system that we're, um, that we're looking at the, the latency of is you know, some key value store that you're building you know, for work. And, um, uh, and let's say that, let's say that this is what it looks like. And, um, and your boss ex asks you, well, what's the average latency? So I don't know the average latency here, something pretty low, right? Like I, I haven't worked it out exactly, but let's say that, I don't know, maybe it's something like right here. Maybe this is average. So maybe the average latency is three milliseconds. What about this one? Do you think that the average latency in this picture is much different from the average latency in this picture up here? A little bit lower, yeah. But probably not that much lower, right? Now, what if this tail is really narrow, right? Like, what if it's really narrow? So the average latency here might be like... Maybe it's like 2.8 milliseconds or something like that, right? Now, those two numbers don't look all that different, do they? And of course they don't look different because the, the great majority of the requests that you're talking about are all in this chunk over here. It's just this tail part that differs. And so that doesn't change the average latency all that much. But your boss is really unhappy with this, right? They're really unhappy with this. And they're really happy with this, right? So why? Why do they like this so much better than this? Well even though the average latency is you know, very, very similar. Well, it turns out maybe we were measuring the wrong thing. So we were looking at average latency when really, yep, whoever just anticipated in chat that maybe we were measuring the wrong thing is correct. So really what you wanna look at is what the latency is like near the tail end of the distribution. So you wanna know something like how slow were those requests? So in the Dynamo paper, they really they harp on this quite a lot.
they say, what's the latency at the, I think, the 99.9th percentile? Well, in this picture, it might be really bad. It might be like 100 milliseconds. And in this one, it might only be like 10. So now this metric is a lot more helpful, right? This metric helps us see what's much worse about this way of doing things. So the 99.9th percentile in this one might just be right, like right here. So in other words, if you have 100 requests, we want to know, uh, well, maybe if it's 1,000, that'll make it a little bit easier to calculate. Um, if it's 1,000, uh, you want to know the second slowest request out of those 1,000. That's the 99.9th percentile of the distribution. What was the second slowest request? That is what people mean when they talk about tail latency. The latency at the high end of the distribution of all the requests. And they, they, um, they emphasize this in the, in the Dynamo paper because they're very proud, understandably, that Dynamo has good tail latency because they made a particular effort to, to, try, to try to minimize this tail latency. Now, when I said you're looking at the second slowest request, right, the request at the 99.9th percentile, if, if it's 1,000 requests, it's going to be you know, the, the, the second slowest out of all those requests. Why don't you look at the very slowest one? Well, it's because in every system, there's going to be some weird behavior, right? So out of 1,000 requests, you know, if there's one that took really, 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 really long, right? If one, if one request way out here took 300 milliseconds, you have to draw the line somewhere, right? Maybe you don't care so much about that. But what they determined in this, in this paper, and you know, more importantly from their years of, of thinking about it, was that the 99.9th percentile was something that they really could optimize for. And then um, in some later work that they did, they looked at the 99.99th percentile and so on. Um, but that's what they mean by that. And that's why they keep emphasizing this in this paper, because they're trying to encourage other people, too, to, to talk about tail latency. And so hopefully, you know, this picture kind of makes clear what that means. That's why they talk about it so much. All right, we're out of time for today. Um, next time, we're going to talk about yet another topic that comes up in the Dynamo paper, which is consistent hashing. And that will take all the, the entire uh, uh, class period next time. Uh, so I will see you on Thursday. And enjoy working on assignment three. See you in a couple of days.